Welcome back to another episode of Simply Unprofessional. I'm your host, Webby. Joining me tonight, my wonderful co-host, Devin. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm sure you heard my front door open. <laughs> no. No? Oh, man, because it showed up pretty <laughs> loud on the audio register it. here. I definitely was just making that up. I definitely heard it. I'm sure they heard it over the music, <laughs> too. But, hey, That's you know one. what? <laughs> We're simply unprofessional for a goddamn reason. Uh, so yeah, hey, uh, Devin, what is this week's episode going to be about? This is me interviewing Webby oh, about his beautiful, wonderful childhood that nothing ever went wrong. I mean, I really, I mean, yeah, we'll get into it. I, 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 I liked my childhood. I just, yeah, yeah, it was typical. So. At what point did you start hating life? That's a question. I oh, I man. <laughs> uh, well, we're starting in deep. Okay. I mean, I could probably answer that if I put a little thought into it. It wasn't my childhood, though. Like, I mean, I don't know. I had I had a bumpy childhood, but I don't know. I, I'm one of those people where even... Let's talk or throw the shit out of this. Like, so at, what, so at which, which relationship... With a woman just turned you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I have nothing bad to say about any of my exes, um, except that one that we're not talking about. Oh, well, I mean, I don't count. I don't count just dates. Some of the dates I've been on have been pretty insane. Uh, but no, like I've I've even sat down. Not like I, every child has, you know, something bad that's happened during their childhood or whatever and you know nobody grew up in that fairy tale you know everything is hunky dory kind of life but i mean i i've 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 explained to my mom and my dad because you know they're separated and that was kind of a rough time in my life and i've explained to both of them that no matter what no matter how they feel no matter what i say Everything that has ever been bad in my life, so to speak, I'm okay with. I've uh, as I grew older, yeah, it sucked at the moment, but as I grew older, everything, the good, the bad made me who I am now. And I I like who I am, so I'm okay with this. Yeah, there you go. So, that's my Same outcome. So, head. I'm going to preface that with whatever gets talked about today. Mom, I know you listen. I love you. I don't blame you for anything. You made me into the person that I am today, and I hope you're proud of me. That's it. Of course she's proud of you, Webby. Who wouldn't be proud of you? I mean, I'm not proud of me a lot of the times. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, that's for different reasons. All right. I gotta get, I'm going to take a little sip of my drink here. I'm not I'm not used to being the interviewee. Interviewee? Yeah. So, well, I mean, man, many people who know, anybody. many people who know, like listeners of SU or anybody who's ever really watched any of our live streams, I'm always the one, like, anytime I'm even a- a- asking questions, like, oh, who's your favorite anime, blah, 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 I hardly ever answer my own set of questions. He so. does. It's true. Like, I just let it go, because then when I'm not feeling like talking, he just lets that go. Yeah. So we have this unspoken understanding that I don't fuck with him, he won't fuck with me. Yeah. But Whatever. this, this it's all out on the table. Whatever you want to ask, I'll talk about. And this is so the listeners can get to know a little bit more about us. All right. So whatever I want to ask. First question on the docket. <clears throat> When it comes to butt stuff, I'm kidding. Well, okay. <laughs> hamster or gerbil? Which which one? Which one is going? You know, I had first? a pet hamster growing up. Oh boy, it died. And then it died. 
We yeah. don't know how. I mean, hamsters, pet they hamsters not always die. Stuff. They do, they do. I mean, my I don't know. Want, I want to say it was our cat that killed it. <laughs> Mine froze to death. Well. I went out of town, and somebody watched it, and then it it froze it up in their basement. We had so. a pet bird that probably froze to death. I don't My dad threw it outside. And then it threw just, it outside? Yeah, because it kept biting him all the time, and it wouldn't shut up. Uh, and so my dad just like literally opened the door, grabbed it, and just threw it out. And then it sat on the branch in the tree, like right next to our front door, squawking for like two days. And then, you just and then it just thing. stopped, and we never heard from that bird again. That was Fred. That was Fred. I don't remember what kind of bird he was. He was like oh, Fred. If you're still out there and somehow became sentient and are listening to a podcast, shout out to you, Fred. Yeah. This one's for you, Fred. This one's for Fred. All right. First question, serious time now. <clears throat> so, Mr. Patrick Webster, where did you grow up and where and were you born there? Oh, let's see. So I've I live in a town called Hooksit, New Hampshire. Okay. I've lived here with the exception of my my stint when I lived down in Texas. I've lived here my whole life. I actually currently live in the house that I grew up in. Uh, and I, I was technically born in Manchester because there's no hospitals in Hooksit, but Manchester's the, the bordering town. Um, so yeah, I was born in, uh, I, I think I was born in the Elliott hospital in Manchester. Uh, I think I, it's one of those things where I think my mom said, or my dad tells me one thing and my mom tells me another. Um, so I was born in one of the two major hospitals in Manchester. But yeah, I grew up in Hooksit my whole life, in the current house that I live in. Um, that's a whole nother story. Because you know how, like, when most parents, they always threaten their kids, like, oh, when you turn 18, I'm getting you luggage for your birthday because I'm kicking your ass out. Well, when I turned 18, my parents split up and, well, they were split kind of before then, but when I turned 18, both my parents left (laughs) and they were like, uh, yeah, you can, you can pay rent now. I was like, well, all right. (laughs) So yeah, I've lived in the same house. So your 18th birthday present was just like a rent, a monthly rent check. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. I like it. Yeah. So. But yeah, Hooks, it's a small little town. Um, for anybody who knows their geography, we are just north of Manchester, which is the biggest, the largest town, uh, largest city in New Hampshire. And we're just south of Concord, which is the capital. It's in southern New Hampshire. So I don't think anything famous has ever really happened here. I'm sure somebody got murdered there. I mean, all the fame. Well, for sure. Yeah, no, we had uh, not at the Firebird Hotel. Cause you, I already told you about that place. <laughs> no, there was another string of hotels it's over by the over by the Brick House uh, where <laughs> the cops just. I think they just found a head. That was like the coolest thing that's happened in <laughs> Nooksit. Uh, that's cool. Okay. Well, I mean, to somebody twisted like me, sure. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's not uncool. I'm just saying, like, hey, that's cool. Found a head. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was interesting news. I was just like, oh, is there going to be a serial killer? But then no other heads were found. So, Aww. yeah. He's like, yo, I want to catch a serial killer. Put me in the case, chief. <laughs> <laughs> Where he just goes down to the police station, like, yo, put me in the case, chief. No, because I'd be more inclined to be like, if I found the guy, I'd be like, so did the people you killed, did they deserve it? Were they bad people? <laughs> If he was like, yeah, I'd be like, all right, get out, quick. I never saw you. <laughs> you know, like the whole Dexter thing. I mean, I rooted for Dexter watching that show. He I was a serial killer. killer. That last episode. Listen, I still rooted for we, him. We, we've we had that conversation before. We're not going to do that here. This is all about you, not about Dexter. <laughs> Fuck Dexter right now. So, yeah, I, I live in Hooksit. I've lived here pretty much my whole life, with the exception of a, a, about a year and a half. I lived in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. So when you live in Dallas-Fort Worth, which is probably the largest, like, area you can just say you live in, and people just say, oh, okay, like, no problem. Um, 
I mean, that was what made you go to Texas for that year and a half? <laughs> a girl. Hey. Yeah, I growing up. <sighs> growing up, I was always the person that everybody, you know, and I and I agreed. I I, I never left New Hampshire. Okay. Very rarely would I ever go even into Boston. Now, all my friends, they loved going into the city. I don't like cities. I'm not a big city Me person. Either. I live on a, I lived on a farm growing up. Um, you know, we raised farm animals. I was just, I don't know. I, I don't dress the part for a city. I don't, I don't do the city thing. Um, and, you know, my decision to up root and move to Texas, man, that was probably the hands down, the biggest decision I ever made. And, uh, I don't regret it. Uh, be- Texas is a beautiful place. Uh, I love it. I'd love to go back someday. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, Hey, home, 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 sweet home, home, sweet home, man. You know, I, I definitely missed it. And, uh, I, I mean, I love where I live. So, I hate the snow. Yeah, me too. That is something we get a lot of during the wintertime. Yeah, it's true. That is a true statement, sir, if I've ever seen one. Um, yeah, fuck snow. Fuck the snow. That's all I'm saying. But right, yeah. Secondary follow-up question, I guess. Well, that was my follow-up question to that. Going to the next question, I should say. So what was it like growing up in your house that you grew up in? Um, I mean, it was fun uh, growing up. I mean, I was always big into like the video game. So I was that kid who I had the Atari. I had the, you know, the Nintendo. Um, but a lot of the times it would also be, you know, my, our mom, my mom would kick us out because, you know, we she'd say, "Oh, go I'll go outside and play," and then we essentially wouldn't come back until the streetlights came on. It was that kind of thing. We had one streetlight uh, across the road from us, and when that one came on, that means it was just getting dark enough to where we should start making our way back home because dinner would be ready probably sometime around then. Um, other than that, I mean, like I said, I lived on a farm, so growing up. You know, we always had animals. Uh, I don't remember a time where we didn't really have we we didn't have a dog of some fashion. Um, we always had cats, but they were always outdoor cats or barn cats, as we called them. Uh, okay. We had horses. We raised cows, uh, and we we split essentially the cows with our neighbor down the road. Um, so we kept the cows there because he had more land for them. And then essentially it was like, oh, say we had 10 cows down there. Five would be for us. Five would be for him. Um, but we had horses. Uh, we raised pigs at one time. I, I, I used to love playing with the pigs, man. Pigs are cool animals. Uh, we had chickens for a little while. We had a rooster once, then my mom got rid of it. She hated it. Walk around one? Yeah, it was just always constantly squawking, which is probably why I hate my neighbor's rooster now, because even, not even in the morning, it's just constantly squawking. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up on a pretty good sized chunk of land. You know, so, I mean, we, we got, like, I want to say it's right around three acres of land. Nice. Uh, I, we've always lived in it. It's technically a two-family home. Duplex? So, kind of, but you know how duplexes are split vertically? We're split horizontally. Sounds so like a split level? Okay. Yeah, so there's an upstairs that has always been rented out. And then there's a downstairs, which the downstairs is currently where I live. It's an above ground basement. So like our floors are concrete and the walls are essentially concrete, Nice, but it's above ground. Uh, we have a garage across the yard. That's about the size of the house. And then in the back, we have a barn that's about the size of the garage. So I want to say we've always had a, I want to say we've had two horses, 
we've always kept them in pairs. Uh, and then if you know, I think when my when my mom's horse, one of hers passed or had to get put down, she got another one. Uh, <clears throat> I know wherever my mom lives now. I don't remember the name of the town, but I know she still raises horses. She's still real big into horses. So I never really cared for them. Like I, I appreciate them as animals, but I never got along with them. Uh, I didn't know the interest intricacies, I guess, of them as an animal. Um, and one time I was standing, I was walking behind them, uh, and they got spooked and started walking backwards and I got trampled by one. Uh, and ever since then I've been kind of skittish around horses. So, Hmm. but the pigs, man, the pigs used to get real fucking huge. I used to jump on their backs and try to ride them. That didn't last very long, (laughs) but they were good animals. I used to always name them after, I remember my, our, our first three pigs. Now people can get all up in arms all they want about me or about this, but they, I knew because I was told when we were getting the pigs, not to get attached to them because they were not being raised as pets. They were being raised as food. And I was like, that's fine. And everybody tells me, you know, if you're not going to get attached to something, don't name them. The first three pigs my dad brought home, I named them Mo, Larry, and Curly. Uh, After the Three Stooges, obviously. Loved these pigs. And then (laughs) I remember we we got them butchered. And then they, my parents brought the meat home and put them in our freezers. And then one Sunday morning, uh, we're eating breakfast. And my dad's like, you know, you're eating Mo right now, right? I was like, I still love him. I loved him when he was a pig. I love him as bacon. <laughs> so, I don't who know. Tasted I, better between, who tasted better between the two pigs? Oh, man. Uh, probably Curly. Curly was the biggest. Out of all three of them, oh, he was a fat boy. Yeah, he was he was big. Uh, so yeah, I don't I know. I, dig it. I really liked him. I the one thing I hated about living on the farm though is uh, the electric fence in the back for like the horse corral area. You would always stumble into it, dude. That you have no it. idea. I had I have <laughs> anything <laughs> involving electricity. I have the worst luck. So. And my dad would fucking watch me. He'd be like out in the garage or something, and he'd watch me like testing my luck with the fence. And like I remember, like my mom would try to like she she she'd be like, "Hey, you, you know, we should probably stop him from playing over there." And my dad's like, "No, no, no, he'll learn. Watch." And like I'd walk up to it with like a stick and just lay a stick on the fence, and then. At first, you don't feel anything because it's not like an instantaneous thing. There's like pulses that go through these fences, right? So like mm-hmm. at first, I'd be like, oh, I don't feel anything because I just tap the fence. And then finally, I'd just lay the stick on the fence. And then finally, you know, I'd get the zap and I would drop the stick <laughs> and jump. Uh, well, I did that with all sorts of things, bottle caps, you name it. And finally, like, I finally got to the point where it's like, okay, I'm not fucking with this fence anymore. We had a goat, and the goat was in the corral with the horses. So that way it couldn't get out, because we had problems with the goats roaming around the yard. They'd always try to get on the school bus in the morning. And uh, so I was feeding this goat a carrot, and (laughs) it was like, as it was chewing, it was lifting up its head to try to get more and more of the carrot, and I wasn't paying attention. The fucking carrot touched the fence and zapped both me and the goat. Ah, that was horrible. I've pissed on the electric fence, and you know what? I don't care what Mythbusters says, that will zap you. I know firsthand that it does. <laughs> so, <clears throat> don't Funny. don't whiz on the electric fence. Was that, what was that? That was a Ren and Stimpy song or something? I think it was. <sighs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, growing up, I mean, I had chores, you know, uh, in the wintertime. Uh, during the summer, my dad would chop wood and split wood. So in the wintertime and stuff, I would have to bring wheelbarrow loads of wood into the house, whether we lived upstairs or downstairs. Because throughout the years, I've switched. 
as my parents split up or moved out or we got more or like new tenants or whatever, uh, most of my childhood, I lived downstairs where I live now. Mm-hmm. And then at, I don't remember when, but at some point I ended up moving upstairs and I lived upstairs. Uh, and then I moved back downstairs. Um, and then I lived upstairs again. We've, we've bounced around, but either way, Which I'd have to prefer? up or down. Oh, I've always preferred downstairs. It stays cooler in the summer, uh, and it maintains the heat in the winter. Um, plus, it's just, I don't know, more familiar to me. So, Although I will say I don't like... There's one bad thing about living downstairs, and that's anybody who walks around upstairs, if they don't consciously remember that people live downstairs people tend to walk with a heavy foot so you can hear them running back and forth upstairs it's just like god dang it you know i mean i'm a big guy and even i walk softer than a lot of people that's that have lived up there so but yeah i mean that was essentially my childhood used to go out in the woods and chop down trees for fun uh, we had four wheelers, so I'd ride around on four wheelers a lot. I spent a lot of my time on a lot of my years on four wheelers. Um, I used to try to make traps out in the woods that, like, looking back on it, seem really dangerous now. <laughs> but at the time, it's like, yeah, this will work. And then they just never worked anyway. Like, like Home Alone style traps. So, but yeah, that was essentially my childhood. I liked it. I didn't mind it. My dad worked a lot. So, I mean, uh, I tried to spend as much time with him as I could when I saw him because he'd get home uh, pretty much just in time for dinner, wash up, and then he'd watch the news and then go to bed. And then on the weekends... Uh, he'd spend a lot of the time out on, he had a, a boat out at the ocean. So if I, if I didn't go with him then, then he'd be pretty much be gone all, all weekend too. Um, but got to spend quite a bit of time out on the ocean. So nice. that's where my deep sea fishing stories come from that we were talking about the other day. I never really freshwater fished. I didn't care for it. But, yep. Moving on. Uh, if you had to, your, uh, your parents, describe what they do. Oh. How were they? Um, my parents were good. Uh, my mom was a cleaning lady. She's, I mean, she owned her own business. Uh, she does to this day. Um, my dad worked at a, a scrap yard, like a junkyard, and he was a truck driver. So uh, he had that truck driver mentality of, you know, he, he'd also be out, you know, He'd be gone for like a week or whatever when I was really little. Then he kind of stopped being an over-the-road truck driver, and he worked more just at the scrapyard. And, I mean, again, that was kind of my second home was over at, at Lambert's Junkyard out in Hooksit. Uh, just running around, playing in all the junk cars, which seems real safe, right? No one cared back then. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, they had their issues. Like I said, the um, I will say alcoholism runs pretty deep in my family. Uh, both my parents had a, a pretty bad go of it as far as that goes, but very rarely were they ever heavy drinkers at the same time, if that makes sense. So yeah. it would be like a trade-off where... If my mom was the more sober, responsible one, then a lot of the times my dad wouldn't, my dad would be out and he wouldn't get home until, you know, 
the early hours of the morning or whatever, and then he'd pass out, and then he'd wake up at 6 o'clock to go to work, and then he'd do it all over again five nights a week. And eventually, you know, those tables would flip, and my mom would start staying out, and my dad would be the one. and Whoever was staying out, the other one would always stay up waiting for them to get home. And I, I do remember that um, they'd argue when they got, you know, when they confronted each other and whatnot. And I, I would always be awake for those. And that was kind of the more, I guess, the rocky time of my childhood was watching and listening to my parents fight um, and trying to mediate them at such a young age. Uh, like I remember coming out and closing the front door and just standing in front of the front door, not letting, you know, my dad leave. Cause sometimes it would get to the point where my dad would just throw clothes into a trash bag and go stay at a hotel for the night. Um, but, uh, I mean, other than that, my dad, probably the hardest working person I know, um, he worked at the same place my whole life up until uh, he ended up having a brain aneurysm years ago uh, and he had surgery. And ever since the surgery, he was just, he's, he's not able to do the things that he used to be able to do. Um, so he's been pretty much on disability since then. Um, my mom, like I said, she's still a cleaning lady to this day. Um, both extremely supportive and I, I tip my hat to both my parents having to deal with, uh, you know, us kids, you know, me and my siblings and being crazy kids. Um, I like to think that I wasn't that big of a handful, uh, I don't know. I mean, if my mom's listening, mom, you can chime in and you can send us a message on Facebook or write us an email. But uh, I like to think that I was an all right kid, Um, just like every other kid, though. Like I threw my temper tantrums once in a while, but, you know, I never. With the history of alcoholism in my family, I was never the kid. I never drank, really. Uh, I only really started drinking when I was already 21, maybe a little earlier than that, Mm -hmm. but I always had the mentality going into it too, that I laid myself out a very strict set of rules for when I drink. And if, if those rules are not met, even while I'm drinking, then I'll stop drinking. And I'm very conscientious about that because, you know, I'm a firm believer of, you know, I don't want, I don't want to go down the same road that my parents went down or that I've seen my sister go down. You know, I've seen enough alcoholics in my life to know that that's not a good path. Uh, I don't mind, you know, like when we do the live streams and stuff and we're having a good time. I don't mind cracking open a beer and having a couple beers or, you know, having a couple of my Dr. Comforts in my big ass 50 ounce glass mug. Uh, but, you know, a lot of my family, they drank to get rid of pain. They drank to get rid of sadness and that just spirals, man. And so, you know, if I'm sad, angry, depressed, you name it, I won't, I won't touch alcohol. I won't go near it because I don't want to become dependent on that. Um, and to this day, I mean, I've, I've never, I've never broken any of my own rules. Like we used to have bonfires when I, when I had my, my roommate, Eric lived with me, we'd have bonfires once a month. Um, and, you know, we'd have like anywhere from 20 to 50 people show up to these things. And I would start drinking before anybody even showed up. Cause I have, you know, large groups of people, you better believe I need alcohol, but 
at the same time, I was hanging out with friends. So it was like, I'm a very happy drunk when I drink. Uh, very typical Irish. I, I, I like to tell a lot of stories. Um, but I remember one one bonfire pretty late into the evening because I was already pretty trashed. Somebody had disrespected me at my house. And it, it, I got mad. Like, I got livid about it. So I stopped drinking and I switched to water. I started sobering up. You know, I mean, I, I have to put myself in that mindset and maintain that. But, yeah. Um, but as far as my dad and my mom, that's, I mean, that's what they did for work my whole life. Uh, like I said, now my dad's now retired slash on disability. Uh, my mom's still a cleaning lady and she recently went to school for, I believe, accounting and she graduated from college. Um, and I was super proud of her for that. Uh, it takes a lot of guts to go back to college later in your life to begin with and let alone stick through it, no matter how tough it got. And she did. I was very proud of her for that. So, but yeah, that's my parents in a nutshell. Oh, I will say this actually, when it comes to my parents, my mom, scariest person I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it got to the point where when I was a kid I remembered it mainly for two occasions either Sunday morning breakfast because we would always have like a big Sunday morning family breakfast my dad would cook and also on Christmas I remembered this vividly because as kids during Christmas we could not open our presents until after we ate breakfast and after the table was cleared and, you know, the dishes were done and stuff. And then we would all come out into the living room. We'd sit down. And once we were all situated, mom would pick one of us. We'd start passing out presents and opening up presents. Well, every Sunday morning and on Christmas morning, my dad would be cooking. My mom would be, my mom would be sleeping in. And my dad would be like, okay, go wake up your mom. It's like, what? <laughs> no, I don't want to. <laughs> like... Because, like, I would go in there and I'd be like, Mom, Mom, breakfast. And she'd be like, get out! And it's like, oh, my God, fine. I'd run out of the room. <laughs> She's She was never a morning person, ever. So, very, very scary. She, she always used to throw shoes at me whenever she was mad, too. So, hmm. yeah. But, anyway, those were my parents. Siblings. Oh, boy. All right. This is where I told you. I remember last week we talked, and I said uh, my family's pretty complicated, but I try to simplify things. So I have three sisters and a brother. The brother I do not consider a brother, especially anymore. Now, I will preface this. My three sisters and my brother, they are all half-sisters and half a half-brother. Uh, one of the sisters is more of an adopted half sister, if that even makes sense. I don't, I don't know how all of it gets into it, but essentially my dad, my dad was married twice before my mom. Okay. In his first marriage, he adopted my oldest sister. Uh, and then had my sister Sheila so my sister Sheila is a half sister and then his second marriage <laughs> some of the stories he has to say about that his second marriage is he he had my brother PJ and my sister Carrie and then with my mom I'm my mom's only child uh now, as far as my siblings go, uh, like I said, me and my brother, we never got off on the right foot. Uh, growing up, he was always a problematic kid, uh, always picking fights with me. 
and always just getting into trouble, stealing, you name it. Um, the majority of my life, he's either been in juvie, foster homes, or jail. Uh, he was big into alcohol, drugs, theft, you name it. He's always been a liar. Um, just that typical guy, you know? And uh, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, my dad would always try to, you know, see the good in him. So I would always try, but it always ended up biting me in the ass. And just recently, um, there was a stint where, you know, I went through some dark shit in my life. Uh, I went through a pretty rough patch in my life and, I never had that older brother, you know, figure in my life t- t- to look up to and ask questions, ask advice about. And I had reached out to him, you know, on the computer. And I said, hey, listen, this is kind of essentially what I'm going through. I know that you've gone through some dark stuff in your life and I just, I'd like some advice or whatever. And he essentially turned around and said, you know, you're not my brother. I never asked to have you in my life, this, that, and the other thing. I was like, okay, fine. So I just let it sit there. And then he reached out to me uh, probably five months ago or so from now. Uh, And he started apologizing and, and wanting to be part of my life and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I, I told him, I was like, no, nah, man, that's that's not how this works. That's not how family works. That's not even how friendships work. You wanted nothing to do with me in the darkest times of my life. And now that it's convenient for you or now that you want something, you expect me to just let you in. It's not happening. And I was like, if if you really, really want to make amends about all of this, essentially, give me some time. I'll think about it. And then if I choose to forgive you and if I choose to let you back into my life, I'll contact you. And that didn't sit well with him. And we ended up getting into a big fucking fight. And it essentially ended with me saying, if you ever show your face to me again... I'm going to give you the biggest fucking beatdown you've ever had. Ever. So that's pretty much where me and my brother sit. My sister Carrie feels the same way about him. My sister Carrie uh, hates his guts, disowned him, doesn't consider him a brother. Uh, Most of my family actually does now. Uh, He's just... He's one of those super intense, doesn't know when to stop or back off kind of people. Uh, out of my sisters, uh, my sister Sherry and Sheila, they were, they're a lot older than me. So, you know, when I was younger, they were already kind of up and moved out of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, never really had a problem with either one of them. I, I love, I love my sisters, all of them. Um, Sheila or Sherry ended up moving. Uh, she got married to, uh, my, my, now, I guess, ex-brother-in-law, because they're separated, uh, Danny, um, who I still, you know, he still comes around and visits. She doesn't. I, You know, I never hear from my sister anymore, but Danny comes by all the time. He loves us, and it's like, well, hey, my sister stopped talking to me or stopped really conversing with all of us. She doesn't, she doesn't like, hate me or you whatever. It's just family in the divorce. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, out of that, out of that marriage, uh, you know, they had two of my nieces and one of my nephews who are phenomenal, phenomenal people. Um, Nothing but great things to say about all of them. My sister Sheila had two daughters. Um, She's, she still comes around and visits a lot and, um, I've always kind of gotten along with Sheila. Never, I've never really had nothing bad to say about her. Me and Carrie. Carrie's the youngest of my three sisters. She's only, I think, a year older than me. 
uh, she growing up was always the straight A student, uh, very like the perfect little girl, I guess, you know, straight A student, always did her homework on time, uh, always got her barn chores done because she, she did a lot with horses and stuff when she was younger. Um, and then probably around, probably around middle school, like when she was in eighth grade, maybe freshman year of high school or whatever, she started kind of falling in with the wrong types of people, like just bad influences and stuff. And like when my parents split, she went and lived with my dad and, uh, I, I stayed with my mom. Um, and she growing up, we started like, we always hated each other. We were at each other's throats constantly. And then my dad always laughed and said, you know, you two are going to become best friends. And we just thought he was insane. And then for a while we were, we got super close. Um, you know, she was my best friend. I, you know, just, we had that connection. Um, and I mean, I actually threw one of her boyfriends at the time through a wall, which is now my bedroom wall. Uh, is the wall's concrete? Well, not the internal wall. The external walls of the house are concrete. Okay. Uh, the internal walls, you know, they're just studs and drywall, just like every other you know house. But I remember at the you time, I, you murdering a dude? At the time, I had been living upstairs. And all I heard was screaming and shouting from her and her boyfriend down here because they lived downstairs at the time. And so I came downstairs and I, you know, I was, I wanted to know what was going on and why they were screaming. Right. And it was, it was her boyfriend Wayne at the time. And he told, you know, he kept telling me, keep my mouth, you know, keep my nose out of their business. I was like, Hey, Hey, Hey. When, when you're being this loud, it's everybody's fucking business. If you guys are going to argue with each other, do it at an indoor voice, and then I won't have to come down here and inquire why you guys are screaming to the point where the neighbors can hear you. Uh, and then he started calling my sister a cunt. And I, I just... <laughs> it was one of those things where I just closed my eyes, I took a deep breath, and I was like, Wayne, you're not going to want to say that again to her. And then he got in my face about it. And then I wouldn't let him pass me because he was in the room. <clears throat> I wouldn't let him pass me to get to my sister. And he started shoving his finger in my face. I have I have anger issues, Devin. And then he pointed at her again, called her a cunt again. <clears throat> so I grabbed him and I threw him down. And then I picked him up off the ground and I threw him through a wall. So, and then I pretty much dragged him outside. He got in his truck and left. And that was that. Uh, man, that that whole relationship with my sister was toxic at that point. Uh, you know that Carrie Underwood song where she mm -hmm. like cuts the dude's car up and stuff? Yep. No joke. That was my sister before that song came out. I came home from work one day. <laughs> okay. Again, I lived upstairs. I, I think I was working at the uh, the oil warehouse at the time. I came home from work, and my sister's upstairs, and I was like, hi. And there was a stranger up there, some, some woman I've never seen before. And I was like, okay, who's this, and why are you guys in my house? <laughs> She's like, oh, this is Wayne's wife. And I was like, oh, I see where this is going. So I walked into my room <laughs> and I just brought her out a baseball bat and I just handed it to her. I was like, I'm going to take a shower now. And <laughs> he pulled in and he had like a big jacked up mud truck. She went out with the baseball bat, smashed everything she could possibly smash on this truck. He came running upstairs and went to go grab my house phone. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to call the cops. Your sister's a psycho. So I grabbed the house phone. We had a cordless house phone. And I threw it and I smashed it up against the wall. And I was like, sorry, we don't get service out here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so, yeah. Um, as of right now, uh, our, my relationship with my sister, I mean, again, she went through a rough period. And I get that. But she has... She has done, at this point, too many things wrong to me and not properly apologized for them that I can't just brush it under the rug anymore. Like, I'm always that person. I'm always the person who just gives somebody another chance. Just gives somebody another chance. But at some point, you just can't anymore. Like, you just... It's that saying where I just have no more fucks to give. And that's pretty much where I'm at. Uh, My sister, like I said, had a bad stint with alcoholism. She's, from my understanding, going on two years sober now, which is phenomenal for her. I'm proud of her for it. But I'm still not super on speaking terms with her. Um, Like, I'm cordial with her when she's around. And I'm not I'm not an asshole, but I'm not going out of my way to do anything for her until hopefully one day I get that apology for pretty much everything, you know? So sure. Yeah, those are my siblings. I'm the youngest. I'm the I'm the I'm the bouncing baby boy of the family. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice, sir. <clears throat> what was your school life like? Huh. Well, uh, I was always the quiet kid. Mm-hmm. I still am. Um, I had, you know, I, I was, I was not the popular kid, but I also wasn't like the super outcast kid either. I was kind of right in the middle for the majority of up up through middle school. Um, had some good long, long friendships throughout school. Uh, I was always probably a, who oh, I'd say an A, B student. Um, the occasional C maybe, uh, I didn't really, I didn't like school, but I was always decent at it, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh, up until school kind of changed for me. I, I think my most uh, my most memorable school moment really was uh, that's when I met Ross. Uh, for the listeners, Ross is the one. He's been on several episodes. He does the music for SU. Um, he's been my best friend since the fifth grade. And... Uh, I don't remember if he actually told this story during his interview with Austin that hasn't been released yet, but if it, if he did, you get to hear it twice. Uh, Ross transferred from another school in another town when we were in fifth grade. Uh, his parents moved into a house down the road from me, about five minutes or so. So we were on the same bus. And I remember on the bus ride home... I I always just sat in the back seat of the bus. I, that's normally where like the the older kids sat or like the cool like the jock kids and whatnot. But right around fifth grade was the time where I got bigger than most of the other kids. So it's like, well, I'm claiming this seat. No one's gonna stop me from sitting here. <laughs> so I sat in the back. And I see this new kid step onto the bus and everybody picked on him. And the thing is, is like when he, so I remember people used to pick on Ross a lot. Cause Ross is like, he's super tiny. He's really short. Uh, and at the, at the time and Ross, if you're listening to this, forgive me, I don't mean this in a, in a, in a mean way, but at the time, I mean, he had, he, he he was odd looking, I guess. Uh, um, and people used to pick on him for it. 
Not in like a bad, like he wasn't odd looking in a bad way. It's just he had like, I don't want to say it because I don't want, I don't want Ross to get upset with me. Let's just say people picked on him for his appearance, okay? And when he when he got on the bus that afternoon because he was driven into work that day or he was driven into school that day by his mom, when he got on the bus the afternoon to figure out you know what bus he had to take for the bus route whatever, every person that he walked up to who had space in their seat on the bus put their bag there or just wouldn't let him sit there. And finally I got, it was one of those things where I got tired of seeing this. And by about when he made it to halfway down the bus, I just, I waved to him. I was like, Hey, you can come sit with me. And you know, everybody kind of gave me the dirty look because I'm letting the weird kid sit in the back of the bus, which was the best place to sit, you know? And we just instantly clicked, and we've literally been best friends ever since. Uh, I spent so much time at his parents' house. His mom <laughs> yells at me when I call her Mrs. Boyd. Uh, she yells at me, and she just she corrects me and tells me I have to call her mom because she's essentially my second mom. Uh, I uh, I've done some pretty gnarly things that not a lot of people are aware of except for possibly Ross uh, to pre- to protect his little sister because she's like a sister to me, you know? Um, but yeah, that was probably one of the most memorable like middle school moments. Other than that, I mean, I don't know. I was just, I was like the anti-bully oh. bully, I guess. Like I bullied the bully bullies. I don't know how that would word. I don't know how to make that sound right. I was the bully bullier. I don't know. Um, growing up, I only had one bully who ever bullied me. Uh, I actually got to the point where I'd like come home and I'd be like half in tears. And then my dad finally sat me down and he's like, you know, if this kid turns around and he smacks you again, just drive your fist straight into the bridge of his nose. I was like, all right. And lo and behold, the next day, a kid sat in front of me on the bus. He turned around, he slapped me, and uh, started laughing. And I tapped him on the shoulder, and I reared back, and I slugged him one right in the bridge of the nose. And uh, never heard from that kid again. <laughs> he stopped taking the bus. Yeah, it was bad. Fuck that kid. Yeah, kinda, fuck that kid. I kind of want to know what he's doing now, but I don't, I don't know. Fuck him. So, yeah. As far as high school, um, I don't know. Uh, high school, I graduated high school with high honors. Uh, three point, I want to say 3.6 or 3.7 something GPA. Um, I, I was one of those kids, especially senior year. I just, I always hated school, but I forced myself to go. Uh, I would drive to school. I'd, I'd drive my my cousin and his buddy, Stubby. <laughs> uh, we'd sit in the parking lot at high school, and then we'd flip a coin to see if we skipped school that day or not. And if it came up heads, we'd skip. If it came up tails, then we'd flip again. <laughs> Uh, and there were several quarters that I should have probably eat out. I guess eating out was a thing where it's, a, it's essentially just an attendance failure. So you fail all your classes due to your attendance. Uh, but I had this thing going with my assistant principal at the time where if I eat out, he'd pull me into his office and he'd play me at a game of chess. And if, if I won he would cancel out my my uh my attendance issue and I'd get the whatever grades I had earned. Uh and if he won, then my attendance failure would stick. And uh he never once beat me. He wasn't really all that great at chess either. Uh but yeah, I don't know, that was I mean average kid in school. Um, never really gotten into many fights. 
tried to stick to myself. Uh, the one regret I have happened in high school, and it happened to Ross actually. Uh, some he he was. I uh, I think I offered him a ride home, but he was waiting for his mom to come get him. Uh, and so I left high school. I, I left school for the day, and some kids messed with him and tried to steal his his CD player or his, his Walkman or, or something. And Ross kind of got in their face, and they ended up beating him pretty good. And uh, when I heard about it, I raced down to his house. Like I said, his parents only live like five minutes down the road from me. And I ran into the basement and, you know, he had like the black eye and, a, you know, s- swollen parts on his face and stuff. And he was just sitting on the couch, on his couch. Dude, never have I that fast dropped to my knees and started bawling my eyes out over something. I felt horrible. You know, I just, even to this day, I feel like if I stayed with him until his mom had gotten there, that wouldn't have happened. Or at worst, it would have happened to me and not him, which I would have been okay with. I I was always that guy where, you know, unless, I, I grew up in that type of friends, with the type of friends where unless they asked me not to. If somebody ever started shit with them physically, I'd step in. But on the flip side of that, if anybody ever started shit with me, I made it very well known to all my friends. I would not want them stepping in because I wouldn't want them getting hurt about, you know, by anything that I was, for whatever reason, causing. Um... Yeah. Anyway, that was my school life. Next. Dope. Hobbies? Oh, hobbies. Uh, video games uh, was a big one. Uh, me and Ross used to love playing games down in his basement. Um, Magic, the gathering. Uh, we had a We had a couple good close friends that played Magic. Me and Ross, we'd constantly play Magic, and then we'd constantly always get the rules wrong, but we didn't care, and we'd just kind of go with it. Uh, And we have this unique way of playing where (laughs) we would forcibly toy with each other, and essentially we just... We play it until we got a huge field of shit on either side, and then we'd finally attack each other and see what was left afterwards um let's see when i was younger yeah like i we said during your interview uh you know i played pogs for for a little while i I mainly collected them um when i was much younger i played little league baseball uh they, they nicknamed me the hammer uh and yes whenever I went up to bat, they'd always start doing like the MC hammer chant. Um, like it's hammer time. Uh, they nicknamed me that because I was one of two people in the league who was capable of hitting home runs on the fields that we played on. Uh, let's see. Four wheeling was a pretty big hobby. Uh, that eventually, once I got my license and once I got my mud truck turned into four wheeling of the mud truck variety instead of the four wheeler variety, uh, that became a very expensive hobby. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean. Video games, movies. I'm 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 a big movie enthusiast. Um, I don't particularly care for books, but there are there have been a few book series that I have physically read that I'm glad that I did so, and they're some of my favorite ones. Um, 
Speaking of books, I have, I'm still trying to read Stephen King's It. I've seen the original movie. Uh, my mom lent me her book when I was in high school because I had like uh, free periods, like kind of like a study hall period, I guess, where, you know, you essentially sit in a room and you could work on other schoolwork or do whatever you wanted for a class period. And uh, so I figured, oh, I'll just I'll bring in a book and I'll just read a book, you know. I've never gotten past page 42 in that book. I just, I don't know, I always lose interest in it. It's like, ah, the movie's so much better. <laughs> hey, I mean, listen, I'm sure the books are always better because they get into more detail and stuff, but I just, I can't get past page 42 or whatever it was. And that's like a thousand page book. Really good book. I just, um, what I did with that book was, is I was, I was, having a hard time focusing and reading kind of the same thing you're doing. Um, so what I did was I uh, went and um, did the audio book. See, we didn't have audio books when I was in high I mean, school. Like now, though, like... I mean, I'm sure I could listen to the audio book of it now. Um, but I mean, reading was always kind of the, the worst part for me. Uh, the worst, the the hardest part for school for me was reading, because I would be the one, I'd be one of those people where I could read really fast, but I had a hard time retaining the knowledge from what I just read, so I'd have to reread things a lot. So, and, and it's not, it's not so much, oh well, you just read it too fast, so read it slower, and you won't have that problem. It doesn't matter if even if I read it slowly once, I have to go back and reread it a second, possibly a third time to understand what it is I'm reading. Um, but yeah, once audiobooks came out, that's how I, I, I listened to the game of Thrones book books on audio. I'm still in the process of doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> growing up, uh, I don't think I got my, I had a com okay. Technically, I had a computer growing up, but I'm talking. It was like it was mainly the big ass fucking floppy disks, like not the oh, hard, yeah, not the yeah, hard ones, thing. the big black floppy disks, and it was mainly just a typing computer. Um, I had like two games for it um, that I could play. I didn't start getting into actual like computer gaming until <sighs> till probably 2000 mm. um is when I bought my my own computer. Me and Ross, we played a lot of computer games on his, on his PC cuz he had a computer that we could play on. Like we played Myst a lot. Uh, the original Warcraft game, like the RTS, uh, we played um, stuff like that. But, I mean, I always had consoles growing up. Uh, that's how I originally became a video gamer. And then finally, once I got a computer, it's like, oh, look at these games that I can now play. Um, I mean, that's where I essentially my very the very first game I ever put on my computer. When I first bought one, it was a fucking shitty ass Hewlett Packard computer, but it got the job done until I could upgrade it. Well, sure until I could have my, I think I, I think my cousin built my very first one for me. Uh, like I just bought all the parts and he put it together, and then like my buddy Eric, my buddy Chris, they put they they helped me out putting together future computers because I'm real bad at computer stuff. But uh, the very first game I ever played on computer. Diablo. That that is where my love of Diablo came from. That and a Bard's Tale. I love me some Bard's Tale. But <clears throat> yeah, I mean those are my hobbies. Uh me and Ross, we had a band. I was in a band for a little bit a little, little bit of a time. Um I don't know how to play any instruments, so he essentially handed me one of his bass guitars, showed me a a chord, I guess, or a few chords that I could play that were relatively simple, uh, and I pretty much just played the bass for 
the one hit song that our band had. <laughs> nice. Um, Ross, I don't know. He's 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 the musical genius of the group. So I've always been right. Oh, I was big in the writing. Uh, all right. People might laugh at me for this. <clears throat> uh, I write songs and poetry. I still do. It's been a while since I've written, but I used to write a lot. Um, like especially in high school, that was that was my main outlet for a lot of that. Because high school was the hard part for me with my parents splitting up, and I lived with my mom, and then my mom went through a lot of stuff, and her and I didn't see eye to eye all the time uh, with her drinking and, and stuff. And then she got a lot better about it. Um, so that was kind of my outlet was my writing to get rid of all of everything that was weighing me down. Uh, and then through my writing, my English teacher suggested that I speak with uh, one of the program directors at my high school. And then my vice principal pretty much made it mandatory that I attended this anger management thing in high school. And then I was promptly kicked out of anger management. So. Yeah. Add that to my repertoire of things. I'm too angry for angry man anger management. Hmm. So it's very interesting. Well she fucking I I don't know. I threw a chair across the room, almost hit somebody and then ended up putting the chair in a wall. And then hmm. I was just asked I I was told that I could leave and I was asked not to return. Now why did you do that? Because she kept asking me questions uh, about something that I told her I didn't want to talk about, which I get it. That's the whole point of anger management. Uh, but at some point you got to understand, you know, you can't just force somebody to talk about something they're not willing to talk about yet. You got to try to ease them into that conversation. Right. You know, talk about something else until, until I feel more comfortable talking about other things. Then get me to talk about that topic. But she, that fucking bitch just wouldn't let it go. Uh, you know, from day one, it was just like, I don't want to talk about this. And then she kept pushing it, kept pushing it. I was like, you seriously don't want to keep doing this. And she kept pushing it, kept pushing it. And this was a teacher, mind you. So I fucking flung a chair across the room. But... Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Baseball was the only sport I ever really played. I was asked by every single football coach that Same. that I ever went to school for to play football. Same. But never had the desire to. Mainly at first, mainly because I didn't understand like the football plays, and I didn't want to seem dumb. Even though I understand, well, if I get on a team, that then I would understand them because they would explain them to me. But still, and then it was just a matter of, nah, I don't feel like it anymore. <laughs> so, so Webby, um, jobs and how did you end up in the field or job you're in today? Oh Jesus, jobs. Let's see. My first job was at a McDonald's. I was hired. I was hired as a grill cook uh, a year earlier than I should have been, because to work in the grill you had to be older than you had to be if you worked as a register person. Uh, but they put me in grill anyway. I left there, and then I worked at Hannaford Supermarket. Um, which is just a regular supermarket. It's like, a, I guess you guys would have what Kroger's or something over there. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Uh, I did that. I worked in the produce section, which I didn't mind because I worked pretty much by myself in a cooler the whole time, prepping vegetables and fruit. Uh, ended up leaving there. 
Uh, I worked at Kmart for two weeks before mutually quitting and getting fired. Um, what? Just I love that you mutually quit and got fired. Well, you know, when you get physical with a, with a customer, they tend to not want you back ever again. How'd you get physical with a customer? What, what, what that poor customer ever do to you? Listen, he got he got in my face and started yelling at me. So I grabbed him by the shirt collar. <laughs> That's kind of a big no-no when you work retail, apparently. Um, from there, I went back to McDonald's. Because at that point, a few of my friends that I had known started working there. So I figured, ah, sure, I'll go get hired there again. Uh, again, solely in the grill area, in the kitchen. Uh, they made me a manager there. But to be a manager, I had to know how to use a register. So they, for one shift, they tried to put me on register. Uh, that lasted for one customer before they said, okay, Webby, uh, at the time they called me Bubba. They said, okay, Bubba, you can put, go back into the grill now. I was like, okay, that's good. I, this is my safe square back here. <laughs> like, I like it back here. Um, again, because I got into a this time a verbal confrontation <laughs> with a customer. <laughs> um, then that lasted until I got banned from the McDonald's. Uh, and from there, where the hell did I go after that? Uh, from there I worked, oh, I work, I went to work with my uncle, uh, delivering liquor. We'd go to a, we'd go to a liquor warehouse in the morning and I'd drive in a big box truck. And then we would just drive around to all like the restaurants and stuff in Southern New Hampshire and deliver all their booze. Um, after that, I worked at a place called Windward Petroleum, which was just a big oil warehouse. I worked there for four years, ended up leaving there because I moved to Texas. I moved to Texas in 2008. Uh, when I moved down there, I got a job at a bank and I worked as a retail banker for a year and a half. Um, had have, have an interesting story about that. Uh, but then when I came back home, let's see, where the hell did I work when I got home? I don't remember now. Oh, I worked at a New England small tube. It was just essentially just a, a machine shop. I uh, worked there for seven years. And then uh, after that, worked at Manchester Harley Davidson for a couple months until they had to let me go because they were doing budget cuts and I was the newest employee. Uh, and currently now I work at a... Uh, trucking outfit out in Candia. Uh, essentially just, I'm a purchaser. So if the mechanics need parts and stuff, I, I go and I buy the parts and either go pick them up or have them delivered or whatnot. And if they need things, errands ran and stuff like that, that's what I do. And that's what I've been doing since last October. So, I got that job because some uh, a friend of our a friend of our family who previously worked there got me the gig. Um, started off as just kind of general garage help, uh, mainly sweeping floors, picking up after people, doing stuff like that, and then like, two months into that, the owner found out that. Uh, I know how to work my way around a computer. And he's like, hey, do you want to become a parts guy and do some computer and some office work? I was like, I'd love that. Whatever gets me out of the garage. <laughs> and, and that's kind of how I got into doing that. So. 
Hmm. There you go. When I worked at the bank, that was the very first time I've ever had somebody spit in my face. And stalk you. That was where I got my first stalker. Oh, man. I don't know if I... You know what? I know I think I've, I think I've told you before this this little story, but I don't think I've told it to like on an SU to like where other people can hear me. Dude, okay, so this girl... The bank was inside of a Walmart, okay? So uh, we were up by where all the cash registers and stuff are. And <clears throat> this girl, I went to go get my lunch at like the Walmart deli one day. And she made me cookies and she swapped out with one of the other cashiers just so she could ring me out, which is unnerving. And she handed me this Ziploc bag full of cookies. First off, they were peanut butter cookies. My favorite cookie. How the fuck she found that out? I have no idea because I never once told anybody that. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I I was like, oh, thanks. That's really kind of you. And then I bought my shit and I, I immediately sprinted back to the bank. Uh, I put the cookies on top of the vault in the back room. And I'm continuing to eat my lunch or whatever, right? And Christina, the new girl at the bank, she comes walking in. She's getting ready for her after she's doing the afternoon shift or whatever. I'd been working with her for probably about, I don't know, three weeks, maybe a month at this point. And uh, she's like, "Oh, who brought the whose cookies are these?" I was like, "Oh, they're mine. If you you can have one." She opened them up and she starts eating one. Right? <laughs> I'm just, I'm not laughing, but I'm watching her eat this cookie. And she's like, "What?" I was like, "Nothing. You know, whatever." And like five minutes later, she finishes up. I was like, "Hey, how's that cookie?" She's like, "Oh, it's pretty good." I was like, "How do you feel? Are you okay? Is your vision okay?" Are you feeling lightheaded or anything? She's like, why? And then she blinked for a few times. There was this pause of silence. She says, your fucking stalker made these, didn't she? And you tested them on me? I was like, hey, I wasn't going to eat one until I knew they were safe. (laughs) That's fucked up. (laughs) What if she was just playing the long game? What if she... What if she only dosed one cookie? I still still did not eat any of those cookies. I didn't trust that at all. Who knows, Webby? You could have been happily married to your Walmart. Nope. Nope. (laughs) Nope. Uh, God damn. Hell no. Life could have been so different. Dude, it's fucked up because like I was I was dating someone. I was dating someone at the time and she I told her about it and she started laughing. She's like, oh, that's so cute. And then she started picking on me about it. And I was like, no, it's not cute. It's fucking scary. And uh, my assistant branch manager, his name is fucking, his name's Rob. It's just another Rob that I know. Uh, Wait, what? Wait, you talking about me? Yeah. So my assistant branch manager, his name's Rob. He knew that I was dating someone and he knew about the stalker. He went to go purchase a drink out in Walmart and then bring it back. He purposely stood in her line and then he started making small talk with her. She asked him if I was single or no, she asked him if I was married and he's like, no, I don't think he is. And then she asked him, is he seeing someone? He's like, no, I don't think he is. And then he walked away. (laughs) I was like, way to throw me under the bus there, dude. It's fucked up. It's really bad. And then I moved out. Then I moved away from Texas. I left. I left the bank job and I moved back home. Never once said anything to my stalker again. <laughs> so, all right, moving on from the stalker, Devin. How did you become a part of Distractions Media, sir? Oh man. So kind of kind of like you. Uh, so I, I listened to when I when I worked at New England Small Tube. That's all I had to do. Eight hours a day, of just listening to podcasts. Um, in fact, it took me a little while. At first, it was just music. I had a little MP3 player with music, and then somebody told me what a podcast was because I didn't even know what a podcast was at the time. 
Uh, and then I started downloading them on my phone and I started listening to all these different podcasts. And then I've always been a huge fan of D and D. So I started looking up D and D podcasts and I came across the dungeons and randomness. Um, and then through that, I came across dungeons and distractions. And I, so I started listening to that one more and more and, then I reached out. I remember Colin was the DM at the time, and he allowed, you know, essentially an open invitation for listeners to come and write to him and have a chance to come on and be part of like these these one little one shot things. So I I wrote to him and uh, he invited me on. Uh, I think I want to say the first game I played, I was an orc. Uh. And then I know I, I played a Kenku, which I think was in the game that you played, Devin, where I essentially, I, I specific, he gave us time to prep stuff. I specifically put up a scroll with a Rune of Explosion thing on it for, for Austin's character, Talon. And the reason that I say specifically for him is because I had it where if you come out of the back door of the inn, there would be a, a scroll nailed to the wall and then I sprayed it with woman's perfume and for whatever reason I knew Talon would be the first one to go for it and he opened it up he read it it blew up in his face and then that big fight occurred he dropped a fucking meteor on us uh I know he he something had we were there to kidnap Iroh or something and uh I don't remember exactly what it was but he Someone drank chaos potions, something or other. Yeah, he had the other half, and I he ended drank up, half of it at the boat, and he and, threw the other. I either drank it or threw it on the ground before you guys could take him away. Yeah, and my Kenku ended up growing antlers. Uh, so now I, I have it. There is an antlered Kenku running around in the world. Um, so there was that interaction, and I know, I know, I made an impact on Austin at that point because when I when I squared off against him, I immediately went for Zidane first. I just, I pinpointed Zidane. I took Zidane down to zero and then me and Austin battled it out and I ended up running away. Um, but then we had the big, uh, essentially Colin, Colin had won a private game with Jason, who is the DM of Dungeons and Randomness. And so Colin put together this big battle royal thing where the top X winners of this battle royal, he would bring with him to this private game that Jason was going to DM for him, this one shot or whatever. Devin, you were in that one too. Yep. I believe it was your character who, me and Austin, Austin had contacted me. You and Austin were brothers. Yeah. I killed Austin's character. And you forced me to fall in love with you. No, uh, did I force? No, something happened. And, uh, it was something was magical. Like, there was like a there was like a random like. So he was in a room. I think Ed was in a room, or somebody was in a room somewhere doing something, and causing a bunch of chaos. This shit happened, and one of the things was you fall in love with the person in front of you. So we fell and, in love. Yeah, with him. yeah. And I essentially was just at, at that point, like, because I, if I remember correctly, we were beating each other down pretty hard. Like we were fighting, which is why it was. I, I think it was like, yeah, you fall in love with the first person you see, and like I want to say, I almost had you like to the point where you you were gonna probably die if you didn't get yeah, some I sort was. of healing. For sure, I was. For sure, I was. And then all of a sudden, my character fell in love with you, and somebody came around the corner and was gonna start attacking you, and I immediately bypassed you and started protecting you. Like I started standing in front of everyone who started coming at you. We've been attached at the um, moment. I remember John's character, Karnar, he brought Karnar in there. Karnar got turned into a stone statue, and I yeah. ran and I kicked his ass down a pit, into a pit. <laughs> yeah, he died pretty bitchily. Um, but yeah, I remember me and Austin, I like I I I kind of contacted Austin on we were talking on Facebook or whatever, and uh we had made up the story for these these brothers, these minotaurs. And that's where the whole Emerald Dawn thing started we kind of came up with that concept and then uh after that you know i had just been kind of a listener at this point still and then austin contacted me 
and invited me to be a uh, a member of the pack when they they were going to get they were going to start the pack uh, podcast. And that's kind of how I got pulled into Distractions Media as a whole. And uh, it was very surreal for me because, like I said, I started off as a listener and I I was a big fan of the podcast. Uh, Like all these, like, even playing the pack, I was nervous at first because, you know, Chris was part of it and he played Iroh and Austin was part of it and he played Talon. And these are two characters in a, in a podcast in a story that I, I really enjoyed listening to. And I couldn't help but be like a little starstruck, like, Oh wow. These guys, you know, they run a podcast and you know, now I'm playing this game with them. And then I go from that to now I DM distractions and I'm just killing. Apparently, it was brought to my attention the other day that I uh, I have killed off more people than other DMs combined. <laughs> it's like, well, all right, I'm a monster. <clears throat> but you kill off people with story, not for your own personal amusement. Though. True. And that makes. I mean, to be fair, some of those people, including Trip and Atticus, could have come back to life but chose not to. <laughs> True. But, I mean, that's how resurrection works. Mm-hmm. You know, your soul has to be willing. Yep. Well, that's what I'm saying. If they had, then your, your your kill count would be way down. And plus, Iroh killed himself. That also doesn't really count against you. True. But I was the DM, so it happened under my watch. <laughs> but So, yeah, that's how I kind of got pulled in. And I know pretty early on, like, it got to the point where... Uh, even a lot of the decision making as far as like certain things like Colin, Colin left being the being the DM of distractions and Austin asked me because um, he pulled me aside and he's like, hey, you know, I mean, I would do it. You know, it, it, either I could do it or you could do it if you wanted. And I was like, well, if you do it, then you essentially have to write talent out of the story, <clears throat> you know. And, I mean, he's one of the original characters of the cast. And so I was like, yeah, I mean, I'll do it. I don't mind it. I've, I've been a DM before. Uh, I still don't think I'm a good one. Uh, that was my main concern when I first took up the mantle of DM was that I wasn't doing – well, I wasn't going to do a good job. And I still fear about that today, regardless of what all you people tell me. Um, you are excellent. But – yeah, uh, and then I just, I don't know, more and more people kept inquiring as to, you know, what we should do in certain circumstances with certain aspects of the organization, and I just had more and more of a say of everything, and now they won't let me quit. I'm literally a prisoner, Devin. That's true. But, and then we had the idea for a podcast essentially where we could sit down and just shoot the shit on a weekly basis. And, and that became Tavern Talk. Um, <clears throat> and then after, I don't even remember how many episodes we had released as Tavern Talk, but after after a while we realized that there was another podcast named Tavern Talk. Uh, and they had had the name just slightly longer than we did like literally by like a month, even though they weren't super active, they had technically had the name and I didn't want to go through the whole, if something comes of this or, you know, if they ask us to change the name, if it comes down to a, you know, an argument between us and the other group of people, I I wanted to circumvent all that. So we came up with the name for simply unprofessional. Uh, I had my buddy Ross write it, write some music for it. And, We've been doing it every week since. Yep. And there has only been one week, week where I missed. So we haven't missed a week period, I believe, right? Nope, not yet. Long. Like I said, there's been the one I week that I missed, season. but you guys picked up the ball and got it done for me. The longest running weekly episodic podcast. And I would ask you about any regrets or anything you would change, but you kind of answered it actually at the beginning of the interview. Yeah, and we were just kind of talking. So now we're into the fun part of the questions. For the, I have three questions. Oh yeah, these are the these are I the impromptu them. questions that I don't even know about. All right. <clears throat> so any trends 
or fads you t- you partook in <laughs> in your youth that looking back you wish you didn't oh that i wish i didn't yes hmm. and then one I- that you would also bring back today fucking okay uh, I'll, I'll start with that one parachute pants Parachute pants or Jenko jeans? Which one? I never wore the Jenko jeans. I had the big, like, the big canvas parachute pants that were actually, you could turn them inside out and they'd be a different color. They were, like, they were reversible ones. Um, And, like, they had, like, the big, ho- like, uh, the bands that you could hook on one leg and then cross over and hook on the other leg, too, for no reason whatsoever. The MC Hammer pants for everybody that knows who that is. Kind yeah. of, but they had a they had like literally a million pockets. They were like insane MC Hammer cargo pants. Um, I really really like those. I don't <laughs> miss wearing those on like really rainy days because they you literally would be dragging the bottoms of your pants through water puddles and stuff. Uh, fads. That I partook in, that I regret. Yes. What if I changed that to uh, not necessarily regret, but ones that I would not partake in again? Yeah, like, like, like looking back, you're like, yeah, that probably wasn't a good look. Fanny packs. I had fanny packs for a while. Um, a little bit. A little bit. Heard a little. Bit. Let's see. Uh. I, uh, no, because I'd probably still do that. No, I mean, that's probably, Fanny Pack's probably really the only one. I I really can't think of any of the other, like, I I was always kind of a unique person when it came to, like, the way I dressed, like, even in school. Now, I live in the Northeast, so even in the wintertime, we get, we get, it gets cold. You can ask Rob. Uh, It gets cold, we get a lot of snow. But... I've always been the kid that wore essentially hoodies and shorts year round. Um, in the winter time, I would wear like big ass boots wearing my shorts, but I didn't fucking care. Uh, I went through a stint in high school where I wore sleeveless flannel shirts over my t-shirts like like Mick Foley style <laughs> or, or Cactus Jack rather but yeah no I mean I can't really think of too many fads that I was that embarrassed about that I wouldn't do again um, other than the fanny pack one yeah no that's it and I would definitely bring back the parachute pants if I could. Next question. Last lie you told and why you told it. Oh, shit. Hmm. I honestly don't know if I can remember. Uh, yeah, I honestly don't know. I don't, I don't have a tendency to to do that very often. Um, if I had to guess. It was probably probably somebody asking me if I wanted to go out and get a drink or grab a bite to eat or something and me telling them that I wasn't feeling good. I didn't want to go out. That's that probably was... That probably wasn't a lie because I don't feel good a lot, but <clears throat> I probably didn't not feel bad enough to go out. It's just I didn't feel like going out. So... Yeah, I don't know. That's a tough question. That's a good one. 
No problem. All right. Ready. Huh? Last but not least. Last but not least. All right. So, house full of all the items from your childhood catches on fire. Oh, you have time to run in and grab one thing. What do you grab? Of when I'm a kid? Of just your whole life. Like, just objects from your entirety of your life. You can grab one thing. All you have time for is one thing. What do you grab? Not including the stuff that I already have on me. You run out the house. Just, you know, your clothes on you. Everything else in the house, you can grab one possession from your childhood, from now, from history. What, what, what do you grab? All right. Well, I asked this because what if I wear a necklace 24 hours a day? Okay, that's fine. You can keep it. That's fine. Okay. Uh, if my house catches fire now, one physical item that I would take, probably my computer. Grab your computer. Like I'm out. Yeah, I mean, it has all of the stuff. All of the porn. I mean, it has all the porn. It has every episode of Simply Unprofessional that we've recorded saved to it. Um, I mean, it has a bunch of recordings from other podcasts, from other games that we've played. It just it has everything that I do saved to it. So, yeah, probably that. Um, if, okay. you, if you weren't including, say, like my necklace... Uh, I probably would have grabbed that. Grabbed the necklace? Yeah. It was a Christmas gift that my mom had given me one year. It was the the Christmas after I had Oreo put down. I had to have Oreo put down. Uh and it's just it's a set it's a dog tag that just says Oreo's name and then the date he was born, the date he was put down. Uh and then it just says best friends forever. Respect. So. All right. And that's all the questions I've got for you, sir. All right. I mean, that was a long interview. It was. Well, not too bad. We're at, we're at that hour and 37 mark. So, I mean, that's respectable. That's good. Yeah. Good interview, Devin. Uh, listeners, if there's anything else that you want to know that you feel like I didn't cover or that you're curious about, feel free to contact me. Either message me on Facebook, Discord, if you know my thing on Discord, send us an email, or message me on the Simply Unprofessional Facebook page. Um, and feel free to ask. Uh, I mean, this this is the whole reason me and Devin decided to do these two interviews first, is so you can get to know the host and the co-host of Simply Unprofessional a little bit better. Uh, the people that you listen to on a weekly basis, hopefully. Um, and me and Devin, I know, both pride ourselves on essentially being open books to people. So if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to let us know. Uh, and with that being said, Devin, can we have a moment of Zen with Devin for the week? I actually did not prepare one for this week at all. Well, sure. Uh, why not? Hold on, I can pull one up. Uh, all right, I have a fortune cookie saying this week with Webby. How's that? All right, sounds good. You're not going to like what I have to say, though. That's fine, say it. You ready for this fortune? You open up a fortune cookie? Yep. The fortune you seek is in another cookie. <laughs> That was the first one that came up. (laughs) There you go, people. Buy some more cookies. Uh, Um, No. Okay. In all honesty, in all honesty, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Um, True. I have one as well. A, A flower falls even though we love it, and a weed grows even though we do not. Yep. There we go. So, Devin, where can everybody find you on the internet if they want to contact yeah, you? You guys can find me on Twitter at DMP underscore Pookie. You can find me on Twitch at Pookie Killed Me. <clears throat> and occasionally you can even find me on eBay hawking some shit I got from a garage sale. Okay. Uh, and you guys can follow me on Twitter at Jack's Forest Walker, all one word. On Twitch at DM Webby. And on Instagram at Patrick.Webster52. 
where I post what was the bird's name? random Jeff? pictures. Uh, the bird? Yeah, it wasn't it? No, our bird's name was Fred. Fred. Yeah. This look you, Fred. Yeah, this one goes out to oh, you I'm wherever wherever you may be, frozen to a tree somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for listening and thank you for downloading. And until next time, everybody, fuck Booster Gold. I found Fred. Oh, did you? He's the Cardinals mascot. Well, he wasn't a Cardinal, though. No, it's fine. Uh, I mean, the Cardinals mascot is named Fredbird. Oh, all right. There you go. <laughs> he said, so fuck you. you. He said, fuck you. Flew to St. Louis. Flew to St. Louis and became a mascot. This is what he's up to today.